All right, I think it's working now. All right, so good morning, everyone in the U.S. and North America, and uh, good afternoon, evening to those of you uh, in Europe and elsewhere east of here. Um, it's a pleasure to host the Fine today. My name is Lauren Hayes. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Fine, um, and uh, I want to um, give a brief introduction of today's speaker. But first, I'd like to. Um, just quickly thank last week's speaker. And so uh, last week, oops, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Apologies. So let me fix that. Okay. So um, last week's speaker, uh, Nigel Bennett gave a fantastic talk on the uh, mole rats and want to thank him for really uh, engaging with the fine last week. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, next week, in case I forget at the end, we have Esteban Fernandez Jurisic. Uh, he'll be talking about improving inferences and rigor. So it's going to be a, a statistical discussion, which I think is really relevant to the work that we're all doing. Um, so I hope people can attend that. Um, this week, I'm really happy to uh, invite uh, to introduce uh, Kaya Tombak. Uh, Kaya is has been a regular attendee, as many of you will recognize her from uh, the Fine Seminar, and um, had a really nice conversation with her this morning about sort of her history, and I'll give a little bit of her background. Uh, Kaya is a, is a postdoc at a Ross Lynn Fellow at Purdue University. Um, she's a National Geographic um, uh, young explorer, and I think we would consider her... Um, We'd consider her part of the um, the rising star crowd in our group, and hopefully today's talk you'll get to see some of the exciting work she's been doing. Um, so Kaya earned her PhD, her undergraduate and master's degree at McGill University in Canada, and after that uh, she took sort of a non-linear path to where she is now professionally. Uh, spent some time in Peru, I think, teaching yoga, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, did some traveling, and then worked on and completed her PhD at Princeton University in 2019. Um, and she then uh, had a, uh, held a postdoc at Hunter College in New York City and is now, as I said, a, a Ross Lynn Fellow at Purdue University. Um, Kaya's research uh, focuses on mammalian social behavior and her projects have been quite diverse in the kinds of the questions and taxonomic diversity. Um, she studied chimpanzee behavior, grooming reciprocity in monkeys in Uganda, and this, looking at, she's also studied the role of predation disease and behavior in zebras. Um, during the pandemic, she uh, took up a literature-based study looking, studying sexual selection in mammals, and I believe we'll hear a little bit about that today. Um, her publication record is quite impressive for this career stage. Uh, she has over 10 papers, and they're in really good journals like Nature Communications, Scientific Reports, Proc B, PNAS, Behavioral Ecology, Sociobiology, and even you know, taxonomic journals as well. Um, and I think one of the things I found really impressive and fascinating about her path is that while as a as a as a um, PhD student at Princeton, she actually participated in an initiative that Princeton runs where she taught biology courses in prisons. And so inmates were able to learn about intro bio and other courses that she taught, which I thought was an amazing way for her to engage with the community. And so today what uh, Kai is gonna be presenting a research, the title of her talk is Understanding the Multiple Selective Forces Shaping Animal Societies. And with that, I will um, turn it over to Kaya. And thank you all for being here and thanks Kaya for presenting today. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and thank you in general to all the organizers. Um, this has been a really um, fantastic seminar series from the get-go and I'm really honored to speak um, as part of it. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna go right into it actually. I'm really interested in why animals form such an amazing variety of societies. Um, it's an important question for things like conservation, knowing when and where 
and how animals group together is important for managing endangered species and for animal care in zoos. Uh, but to be honest, like many of you, I'm just really interested in how animals solve problems collectively. I'll be going through a few uh, social behavior studies I've conducted across different systems, um, but there have been a couple of themes that have emerged. So one of them is that uh, I have found that most, uh, my most interesting discoveries have come from looking where others haven't, uh, both in terms of not taking common assumptions in our field, um, both in sort of behavioral ecology and evolutionary theory more broadly at face value and investigating further, and in terms of pausing to think about non-significant results um, and what story they tell and finding out that it can be quite uh, interesting. Uh, and a the second theme is um, I find that there's a lot of promise in thinking about how social evolution is shaped by multiple selection forces that all act at once. And I, I find that that's actually quite a gap in our field. There's a lot of sort of single selection for single uh, response type of studies. And, you know, that's just because it's actually very difficult to take into account multiple selection forces all acting at the same time on an animal's behavior. Um, but the reality is that animal societies are shaped by so many things at once. Um, animals have to weigh grouping decisions based on, uh, you know, navigating food competition, mate competition, uh, mate choice, predation risk, and so on. All these things that actually challenge uh, an individual survival um, can be mitigated or um, sometimes exacerbated by so sociality. And so that's, so social behavior is used um, as a tool to um, face these challenges. So this might be intuitive, but um, it's actually very difficult to, to study um, in a sort of holistic way. But to me, this represents a frontier um, in uh, our field and it has great promise um, to, to advance forward in our field. Um, so I'm going to use this um, structure that Peter Capeller very usefully laid out to describe the different dimensions of a social system. Uh, I'm going to use this throughout the talk um, to kind of or have a sort of um, or set of organizing principles and dimensions to look at. Um, so he broke a social system down into social organization, um, social structure, the mating system, and care system, and kind of organize the kinds of uh, factors that we look at and the questions that we ask um, within each of them. And I'm going to visit um, each of these as we go along. Um, and the first one is, my first story is on social structure. And it goes back to my master's work on uh, red colobus. Um, this was a study that I set out to do in Kibale National Park in Uganda, uh, originally to measure dominance hierarchies, um, the different sort of uh, aspects of the dominance hierarchy among the female red colobus um, there. And the uh, premise was that, you know, uh, colobus monkeys, they uh, eat a lot of leaves. They're strongly folivorous. And so the thinking was that there's probably not too much competition for this kind of food in a rainforest. Maybe their uh, dominance hierarchies are fairly weak. And I did find uh, that was true. I, I found no detectable hierarchy whatsoever. Uh, agonism was like very rare throughout the year that we studied um, the monkeys. Um, coalitions were never observed and there was, you know, formalized submission that was observed, but only three times. So I found like a very, very flat hierarchy. And I thought that was it. That was the story. No hierarchy. Um, that's it. But part of the reason I thought that that was the end of the story was that there, um, is a lot of work done in our field on what structures dominance hierarchies, um, and how to measure it, the, sl the slope and the steepness and the um, different aspects of uh, hierarchies, what structures it in terms of, you know, is it kinship? Um, it's actually quite, in primates, quite consistently structured by kinship and dominant status. Um, and that was like a very strong focus uh, in primatology, but also uh, across animal behavior studies. But the absence of a detectable hierarchy is or can be interesting. 
And so I thought about this more. Um, and uh, one reason, I guess, I thought that at first that that was the end of the story was because because of the focus on dominance hierarchies, egalitarianism was kind of um, often implicitly and sometimes explicitly assumed to be the result of random interactions. It's basically just the lack of a hierarchy and then you get egalitarianism. But there are actually other ways that you can get egalitarianism. So for example, um, you can just pretend that this is a random network here. It's actually really hard to illustrate a random network. But um, you can get egalitarianism coming from random interactions and that sort of levels out the playing field in terms of the benefits of um, grooming or the costs of aggression. But you can also have uh, structured ways that it might uh, form. So for example, if there's very strong reciprocity um, within a group, then it can also level out the playing field. And if uh, interactions are biased by states that are, are temporary, but that most individuals go through. So for example, reproductive status among females, let's say that pregnant females get groomed more and most females get pregnant at some point, then that can also over time level out the playing field. So there are actually structured ways that egalitarianism can form. And I asked the question, what structures egalitarianism in red colobus females? Um, I found that it was structured. Uh, their aggression, you know, rare as it was, uh, tended to be doled out by older females towards younger females. Um, Age is uh, one of these transitory states that uh, most of the females kind of uh, graduate through. And grooming was structured by both reciprocity. So um, the sort of A to B grooming was predicted by grooming from B to A, um, and also by transitory states like age and residency status. Uh, and in this species, uh, females um, are the major dispersers and so, um, and, and it was interesting, it was actually newcomers to the group that were groomed more. So older females and newcomers to the group were favored in terms of the grooming. And so most of, most of the females in the population would go through both of these transitory states. Um, so that's, that's, some, that's a way that the um, egalitarianism can be maintained. And that's active maintenance of egalitarianism. It's not random interactions. So that, I thought that was quite interesting um, in terms of looking at the question another way. And uh, part of the study was also uh, involved a, a literature review, review to see how commonly um, these um, factors affected uh, grooming um, in different primate societies, including egalitarian societies and despotic societies, and uh, also aggression. And so uh, for uh, one thing that was interesting was that in, in primate societies that were considered despotic, um, or sort of hierarchically structured, it did tend to be uh, sort of kinship and dominance rank that um, really structured their aggression networks. And the sort of one exception where age um, structured aggression networks was in Hanuman Langers, and they have sort of an age inversed hierarchy. And so it could have actually just been dominance rank that uh, was related to age that structured the aggression. But there was this variety of uh, factors that affected aggression networks in more egalitarian uh, societies. Um, and for, for example, in the chimpanzees, we're talking about uh, females here. Um, it wasn't necessarily that the whole society uh, was egalitarian. Some of these networks were um, single sex. Um, and then grooming, uh, once again, for the despotic societies, the ones that were considered sort of hierarchically structured, it was dominance, rank, and kinship. And then again, a variety of uh, factors that affected the networks um, in the egalitarian societies. Another interesting point that we saw was we looked at the correlation uh, between grooming given and received. So uh, a reciprocity index um, in a variety of societies across primates and that tended to be more tightly correlated in despotic societies. And so there might be um, something going on where reciprocity is used to structure hierarchical societies more frequently than egalitarian. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly what that could be from, but it could be, for example, something like uh, there might there there might just be um, more reciprocity, like 
in grooming between kin that's an important factor in despotic societies more so than egalitarian. Um, so that was one story that came out from looking at something um, and it, that was a little bit neglected because of the assumptions of what was interesting in our field. And uh, my second story is going to be on uh, more the social organization end. Here, um, it's uh, a large scale study that I conducted during my PhD on group size and in, in zebras. Uh, and group size is one of the sort of fundamental aspects of a social uh, system. It affects a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, how it's structured and um, the dynamics of a group. Uh, so it's one of these sort of simple measures, but that are, is very fundamental of a social system. And I've been interested for a long time in what affects group size in general. And this is a question that's sometimes uh, posed as, you know, why would individuals come together and why do they disperse? And there's some classic an answers to this question. Um, so there are aggregators. The most classic I would say is predation. So um, there are several mechanisms by which predation is thought to be mitigated by aggregating. For example, uh, if there's more eyes out to watch out for predators, um, vigilance duties can be shared um, more easily in a larger group um, and predators can be more effect effectively detected. There's also the dilution effect where as a given individual in a group, you are less likely to be um, the target of an attack uh, for a given attack. So the per capita risk of an attack decreases in a larger group. Uh, and there's also the selfish herd uh, effect where there's safety in the middle of the group. Lots of different mechanisms by which predation can be mitigated when you have a larger group. And a second one that's a little bit less um, emphasized in literature and came in a little bit later as a factor um, or as like kind of a more classic factor of uh, aggregation or affecting aggregation is harassment by bachelors. I guess you can think of this as like a make competition element. But um, kind of like predation, uh, like persistent harassment by bachelors can act on social behavior by uh, encouraging females to aggregate with each other or with a protective male. Um, and it can really, it can actually drive uh, grouping behavior in many species as well. So it's generally a force for aggregation. And then there are some uh, disaggregating forces. And the ones that are often discussed is, first of all, disease. And we're very familiar with how this works after um, going through this pandemic, where it's very obvious that forming large groups under conditions of high disease transmission risk is not a good idea. And um, food competition is another one. So in, in under circumstances of lower food availability, um, you'd expect, especially food uh, sparsity, you'd expect uh, individuals to disaggregate to try to find enough food. Uh, there are some nuances to this one, especially in primatology. There's a lot of talk about how the food distribution in the landscape um, should affect how food competition affects group size. So there might be some advantages, for example, if you have high yield clumped food resources to have a large enough group to defend it against other groups. Um, but um, under conditions of sort of more evenly distributed sparser food, then you would expect it to be more of a disaggregator. It's an idea that's out there, but actually um, we had it in our paper, it's currently out um, in review. We had it originally in our paper as a, as a point in the intro, but um, the reviewer pointed out that there's actually very little evidence for this the food dis uh, distribution to affect food competition differentially on um, group size. And I looked into it and it's true. There's, it's, it's sort of a strong idea that's been out there for a long time, but um, there's kind of little evidence so far in primatology, at least where this is discussed uh, more that food distribution really does affect group size differently depending on whether it's clumped or evenly distributed. So um, in any case, this study is on zebras and the uh, food distribution is very sort of, it's grasses. Zebras eat mostly grass and um, their food is distributed quite evenly across the landscape and uh, food scarcity should therefore cause them to disaggregate whether you believe that idea or not in terms of the food distribution. 
So getting into my system, um, well, first of all, why zebras? Zebras are interesting for a number of reasons. One of the one of the reasons why my PhD supervisor Dan Rubinstein um, started studying them is that they form, uh, at least the plain zebras and mountain zebras form uh, very stable groups composed entirely of non-kin, which is quite rare in mammals. Um, but zebra social systems are different depending on the species, and it um, they fall into these two types. Um, so there's the stable core groups that the plain zebras form, um, and they um, are composed of a male stallion and uh, unrelated female adults and their offspring. They stay together for a long time, on the order of, you know, well, the average is 3.5 years. So they're quite cohesive. And uh, then on the other side, there's um, the Grevy zebra, which has like very loosey-goosey fission fusion groups um, of, you know, mixed composition. They are not very cohesive. They stay together on the order of a few hours and sometimes days, uh, rarely in some instances, a few weeks. But they uh, will kind of come together, stay together for a while, you know, as is convenient and then wander off. And they're often found solitarily, whether they're males or females. So um, in the plain zebras, the males make guard, they defend mates in their stable groups. And in the grevy zebras, the males uh, defend territories and hope that the females come through. Um, even though they have these different social group systems, um, they, actually have quite, both of them have variable group sizes because uh, while they, there's cohesive stable core groups in the plain zebras, those will sometimes get together into a herd temporarily, and then the core groups break apart again. And in the grubby zebras, it's the individual, that's the unit that comes together and breaks apart uh, in a group. So my question for my, one of my big questions for my PhD was, um, do equids of these two social types adjust group size in response to different selection pressures. And there is reason to believe that they might. Um, so uh, these two social organizations are actually representative of a dichotomy among equids. Uh, the plain zebras, mountain zebras, uh, horses form these sort of stable groups uh, in nature. And uh, Grevy zebras and the asses, the African wild ass and the Asiatic asses form these more fission fusion type of groups. And the latter uh, group of species are more arid adapted. So they um, need less water than the uh, former group. Um, the reason why that's relevant is that, um, so for example, the plain zebra, all of the group members have to drink every day. In the Grevy zebra, they have to drink every three to five days, except if you're a lactating female, then you also have to drink every day like the plain zebra. But this kind of precludes stable relationships between females of different reproductive states because one will be pulling towards water and one will wanna go elsewhere for better pastures. Um, and so it kind of breaks apart uh, the cohesion and the possibilities of group stability. Um, especially because in equids, they have this like uh, over a year long gestation period and it's hard to synchronize reproductive uh, cycles. So the question, in, in these totally different social organizations, do they still respond to the same selection pressures to aggregate and disaggregate or are they actually responding to different pressures? And um, I tried to do this in a big natural experiment. Um, you can't really actually experiment on these kinds of animals. The grubby zebra is endangered and you can't um, experiment with, you know, ethically with like predation risk and disease risk and starvation and so on with these animals. So I had to use natural variation um, to get at this question. And theoretically, you can just think of group sizes varying between, you know, roughly speaking, small groups and large groups. And one... Um, big source of variation in their environments is season. So the wet season and the dry season are completely different worlds. Um, and this is in central Kenya where the, the study was based. Um, so you have you know, abundant green uh, grass and um, abundant water resources in the, in the wet season. 
and then it really dries up in the dry season um, and the grass turns into this sort of junky dried long grass and a lot of the water resources dry up. This is actually a dead impala that got stuck in the mud. Um, it, it can get quite severe in the dry season. So let's start with our disaggregators. Uh, what makes groups small? And that's in the bottom row. There's the disease risk disaggregator and food scarcity. And there's a very, um, there's good evidence that these vary seasonally in op you know, opposite seasons. So the disease risk is strongest in the wet season in the system. That's because um, a lot of the, so for example, the, the, paras the gastrointestinal parasites that I uh, spend a lot of time studying in my PhD, those uh, will uh, transmit much more in the wet season. Uh, they're dispersed through the dung and in the wet season, uh, conditions externally are much more uh, permissive of dispersal and for egg and larval development when, when things are wet outside. So um, most of the egg shedding of their parasites occurs um, in the wet season. And there's also other evidence of um, other diseases like tick-borne diseases, like babesiosis and so on. Um, the titers are, are stronger in the wet season. And so the, the wet season is like a time of high disease risk for these equids. And obviously food scarcity is stronger in the dry season, as you saw in those photos. Um, it's much uh, less abundant and lower quality and sparser in the dry season. So you have these disaggregators that should work towards smaller groups, but acting um, most like during different times of year. And you have the two aggregators that should promote larger groups. Um, predation risk is also seasonal in this system. And that's because we worked in these uh, national reserves that were mixed use. So there would be some level of protection for the wildlife, um, but there were also local ranchers that were allowed to graze their cattle um, on on the reserve lands and they would do so most in the wet season so they would come in um, when there's a great green flush of grass and they would uh, graze their cattle in the reserves in the wet season and lions would just switch over and predate the cattle during the wet season but then when they left they would um, switch back over to the wildlife and so Zebra kills by lions, and lions by far are their biggest problem in terms of predation. There's, you know, some minor risk from hyenas sometimes for like foals, but lions are the major predator. Um, they would kill more zebras in the dry season. So predation has this uptick in the dry season. Bachelor pressure, however, as I mentioned, the reproductive synchrony is quite low in zebras, um, especially in this system. Um, so uh, bachelor pressure is expected to be, you know, fairly persistent across seasons. So we have this like near um, perfect separation of the forces when, of when they should act strongly um, and in terms of the direction of pressure for aggregating or disaggregating. But we have a problem if group size is large during the dry season, it could be due to the uptick in predation risk or it could be due to the background uh, pressure of bachelors. So what we did to do, what we did to um, tease these two apart was we looked at other measures besides just season. Um, and male fem male female ratio was our measure for the sort of local um, bachelor pressure. So uh, at a given site in a given week, if there are lots of males relative to females, we would expect bachelor pressure, you know, all things be all else being equal to be higher. And so if there's a strong effect of bachelors, we would expect uh, larger group sizes when the male-female back ratio was uh, high. And then we expanded um, spatially. So uh, we looked at three different reserves and we chose these reserves um, based on predation risk. So um, it varied fourfold actually across the three sites. Um, we had a low predation site, a medium predation site with twice the lion density and then a uh, high predation site with, again, twice the amount or four times the amount as the low. Um, we assume that this kind of level of differences in line density should affect predation risk. Um, 
to an extent that it would be detectable if it's an important driver of group size in these zebras. And so our study sites are here in central Kenya. As you can see, the plain zebra is distributed across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the Grevy zebra is only in Kenya and Ethiopia. It's uh, an endangered species. It evolved more in the Horn of Africa and its range has um, shifted southward over the uh, recent decades because of largely anthropogenic pressure. Uh, there's a lot of uh, increases in cattle stocking and so on in, in toward the northern part of its range uh, that has outcompeted them from a lot of their range and they've shifted southward and into greater overlap with the plain zebra range. So we studied them where they are sympatric uh, in central Kenya across these three sites, as I mentioned, Impala, um, Samburu, and Lewa. Samburu was our low predation site, Impala was our medium, and Lewa, which is this very fancy uh, national park that or national reserve that's sort of managed for tourism. Um, they really manage it to increase the chances of seeing lions. Um, that's our high predation site. There was a lot of lions there. And we did this by uh, conducting photographic censuses. So we drove, drove regular loops every month at each site. And we took photos of um, all the, so we took notes of all the, all the groups we found and then took photos of all the individuals in the groups um, that we could get. And the reason we took photos was because we wanted to control for individual variation or tendency to group. And zebras have this remarkable feature of having this natural barcode on their bodies so they can be easily identified um, just by their stripes because they're all unique like a fingerprint. Um, of course, doing the photo matching is another story. It's not as easy, especially when you have 70,000 photos to look through. And you can imagine the amount of pairwise combination, possible combinations that presents you with. Um, so we used a specialized software that we worked with a couple of computer engineering um, PhD students to develop. And it could almost entirely just partially automate the detection of re-sightings of individual zebras. Um, and so we were able to use the software program to kind of more efficiently uh, identify re-sightings. And the way we um, chose individuals for um, observe, like as an observation was, uh, so for example, if you, if you just look at group size and frequency of group size, that'll just tell you that. But if you're looking at individual tendency to group, um, then you wanna choose individuals randomly in the population and look at their group size. Um, and uh, the way we did that was we were collecting dung anyway for other uh, studies. So whichever zebra would poop for us, we would um, choose as a random, you know, as a focal individual. And as long as it was recited at some point during the three years that we conducted the study, we remained a focal individual. And it was the group size of that individual at a given time that was an observation. Um, and we didn't exclude multiple focal individuals within a group with, within like one group sighting because if you do that, then you're artificially um, like selecting against the frequency of like um, forming a larger group. Because if you think of a fixed population and a lot of them are in a larger group, um, if you're only sampling it once, then it's artificially reduced in frequency. But if you want to know what the individual tendencies are to group in large groups, you need to have random uh, selections. And if they're in the same group, it's, it should still count. So that's how we did it. Um, and what did we find? We found that there was seasonal differences in um, grouping behavior, and this was different between the two species. So the Grevy zebra, which again is the arid adapted one, they formed smaller groups in the dry season when the food is scarce. And the plain zebra, uh, which is more adapted to wetter environments, formed smaller uh, groups in the wet season. So they disag disaggregated at a time when uh, disease risk was high. Um, so why would there be different sensitivities um, to these two different dis disaggregating forces? Uh, in terms of the disease 
Uh, Grabbies and plain zebras share the same diseases and parasites. We've done a lot of work on especially their gastrointestinal nematodes. We found the exact same set of species um, hosted by both zebras. Um, we know that they're both relatively unaffected by flying parasites or binding flies um, because of their stripes from other studies. Um, and uh, they're both susceptible to anthrax epidemics. That's the big one for zebras and tick-borne diseases. Um, so it didn't really, you know, at face or at first um, seem like they should be differentially susceptible. But we did find a difference in exposure risk potential. And that's because, again, the plain zebras have to stay closer to water. We conducted these sort of long um, range dung count transects, counting zebra dung as you walk away from water up to four kilometers away. Um, that was some of the most exciting field work I got to do because I finally got to get out of the car <laughs> and then encounter things like rhinos and buffalo and hyenas. Um, but we found that uh, dung density, zebra dung density in particular, uh, did decrease with distance from water. And so um, even, you know, up to a kilometer away um, or within a kilometer of water, uh, it would ramp up as you, as you approach the water source. And uh, that also sort of um, maps onto where uh, the average home range centroids are for um, these zebras. So we, we were able to map out home ranges at Impala for different zebra individuals using that stripe recognition software. And plain zebras, their centroids were closer to water than most of the grubby zebras. The adult female and the juvenile grubby zebra centroids were farther or significantly farther from water. Um, the adult male grubby zebras did tend to be closer to water like the plain zebras. And that's again because um, they're Ter they defend territories. The best territories uh, to defend as a grevy zebra are closer to water um, because females are just more likely to, to show up there. Um, but for most grevy zebras, they're um, freer to, because they don't have to drink um, every day or most of them don't, uh, they are freer to range uh, farther away in search of food and uh, therefore, they're not um, grazing in areas with higher, as high of a dung density as the plain zebras. And so there is an exposure risk um, difference there between the species. And that might be why plain zebras are more sensitive to disease risk in their grouping behavior. Um, in terms of the why grubby zebras would be more sensitive to food scarcity, that part makes more intuitive sense. Um, not only did they evolve in the Horn of Africa where there's probably, um, they're probably dealing with like a legacy of food scarcity in their history um, that would make them more uh, sensitive. Uh, they're also quite a bit larger bodied than plain zebras. So they're about 350, 450 kilograms and the plain zebras are between 175 and 250 kilograms. It's a, it's a big difference. Grubby zebras need a, a more of an absolute amount of food. And so it makes sense for them to be more sensitive to food scarcity. We did not find an effective predation on group size. And this is the part of the project that kind of pushes against the assumptions in the field. Predation is the classic, um, you know, selection force on group size across, you know, the long history of looking at group size and in, in behavioral ecology. But what we found was in um, our, uh, medium predation site, the Impala, Impala, that's where the group sizes were smallest and then group size was higher in Samburu and Lewa. So similar in size between like the very low um, line density site and the high line density site, they didn't differ significantly, but Impala was significantly lower. So that does not align with lion density, at least being associated with group size. And we do assume that if line density is, you know, four, fourfold higher, that if it's a big factor affecting group size, it should probably uh, be seen in this study. Um, and this actually aligns with some previous work on plain zebras only, and that was um, using, uh, it was across sites closer to Impala, and it was using an index of predation risks, which you know wasn't just density of lines, but also uh, factored in like habitat visibility and bushiness. And they also found that zebras 
plain zebras did not respond to predation risk by aggregating. Actually, what they would do is like, you know, if there was a, a predator in the local area, they would just vacate the area without effect, without changing their group size. So that's very different from the sort of prevailing narrative in behavioral ecology that predation risk is one of the biggest reasons to form large groups. I'm sure it's still true for lots of species, but for zebras, this like classic prey species, it doesn't seem to be. And then finally, uh, we did find a weak bachelor effect, but we didn't find it in uh, the, our main study where we looked at male-female ratio. Um, if you just look at male-female ratio and its effect on group size, it's flat. But we found it only if we used the same methods as uh, this previous paper did on um, looking at the proportion of the males that are bachelors and looking at group size only for groups that contain females. That part makes sense because you don't expect bachelor group size to increase with a uh, higher proportion of bachelors. But um, that's when we could find the effect. The reviewers made us take this part out of the paper because we didn't have the data to look at proportion of males that are bachelors across all, all, all our three sites. But um, we did find the slight effect when we kind of had this more precise measure for Impala only. Um, and so the general story is that when you put all this together for the gravy zebras, they disaggregated in the dry season um, when food scarcity was high and they uh, in increased their groups slightly in the uh, wet season. Well, they increased their groups in the wet season and that's you know, when there's more bachelor pressure. Um, and uh, plain zebras disaggregated more when there's um, high disease risk and they aggregated more during this you know, time when both bachelors and predators could be affecting their group size. Since we didn't find an effect of lion density at all, and we found this weak effect of bachelors, um, it's probably the bachelors that are driving group sizes up for both species. Um, but I guess that one requires uh, a little bit more support from uh, future investigations to really nail down. Um, and so this was kind of a cool finding because they're ecologically very similar species, but with these different social organizations and these, I guess, seemingly like sort of slight differences in physiology, you know, one needs to drink more than the other can actually uh, affect their responses in terms of social behavior to um, these hostile forces in nature quite drastically. Um, another reason that, um, I guess another link that um, the study makes to their sort of more broader social organization is that if like the plain zebra, you are more susceptible to disease, um, a, a social system that has these like cohesive stable groups um, makes sense. Like they're kind of like our social levels that we had during the pandemic where you sort of limit the rotation of new individuals through your group. You have this core stable group um, and you stick with the familiar individuals within them compared to the fission fusion society and gravity zebras where you're like really mixing and matching a lot with um, different individuals. And so um, it's possible that these different susceptibilities not only affects the group size dyna dynamics, but potentially contributed to their broader social organization, uh, the evolution of their social organization. Next, I'm gonna go through a couple of um, my two last studies that I'm going to discuss, and I'll, um, well, the first one is going to be very brief. It's on uh, group composition and social interactions. And these were two studies that were born out of, uh, you know, pandemic times passion projects where we were stuck inside and we were, um, my colleagues and I from Princeton were looking at, uh, you know, more literature based investigations. And um, they both have to do with uh, actually sexual selection in a way, but the first one, really focuses on group composition and social interactions. And the question we were after is that um, one very common social organization in mammals is a unimale, multi-female groups, um, traditionally, you know, and somewhat problematically called harems. And in these groups, it's been assumed quite broadly that the male is the dominant um, member of the group and that the females are subordinate to him. And uh, it's just kind of been in the literature for a long time, this assumption. Um, we were interested in seeing whether there was actually more of a diversity 
of relationships and especially when you look at not just male female relationships but also female female relationships and treat each individual as an agent you know in the the system and we basically looked across the literature at all the examples that we could find where they provided data on um, relationships between females and between uh, males you know um, the sort of the sort of uh, male within the group, but also like satellite males and, and their relationships and uh, between females and males. And what we found was, surprise, surprise, a diversity so that you can have societies that form this certain group type that have male-female relationships that are consensual or that are coercive. Uh, you can have male-male tolerance of satellites or you can have um, intolerance of satellites. And you can have female relationships that uh, run the gamut between uh, the gamut between cooperative and non-cooperative uh, relationships. Um, so, for example, in the plain zebras, you can have pretty strong bonds between these females. They're unrelated. Again, like the, there's no kinship element here, but they form very strong friendships. Um, and in others, they are non-cooperative. They're either kind of they ignore each other or they're intolerant. Um, and so, there's quite a lot of diversity within this. Um, social structure, um, which means that the social structure doesn't necessarily tell you very much about the group dynamics. Um, and finally, um, we did a big study over collecting data over three years from the literature, um, and it has to do with these final two uh, dimensions of a social system because it's more targeted on uh, sexual selection theory. So most people that I ask, think that generally larger, that males are generally larger in mammals. And we can think of many examples of this where this is clearly, clearly the case. It's also formally taught in uh, biology classes and undergraduate lecture halls. And uh, as behavioral ecologists, we know that for mammals in particular, um, females are not only often busy gestating, but also lactating. And so there's lots, there should be lots of competition for the receptive females in, in mammals, um, which, is, which should select for big uh, briny males. And uh, this goes way back to Darwin's Descent of Man. He stated that, um, you know, most mammals have larger males as if it was a matter of common knowledge. Uh, and others followed along. He's been cited ever since. Um, the, the first to actually look at the evidence, though, was Catherine Rawls. She was at the Smithsonian Institute, and in the late 70s, uh, she reviewed what was known at the time, and she's, she found that actually there's a lot of monomorphism, especially in species uh, or in taxa with lots of species like rodents. And uh, she found that even when there was dimorphism, it didn't tend to be very extreme. And she found that larger females were surprisingly common. So what she found when she actually looked at, looked at the evidence wasn't really in line with this narrative. But as you've probably guessed from this slide, um, there, you know, the narrative continued marching on quite strongly. And um, there were, were a couple of big problems with this narrative. So first, most of our sexual dimorphism research um, in mammals focuses on primates and carnivores and ungulates. But if you want to talk about most mammals, most mammals are rodents and bats by far. Uh, so we have a big taxonomic bias issue in this research in general. The second problem we noticed when we looked into this was that all the meta-analyses so far, including Rawls's analysis, uh, only used mean body mass values for males and females. So no measure of variance and no actual statistics to determine dimorphism. Um, what they would commonly do was, you know, you can't compare two numbers using statistics, but they would often just draw a cutoff at, let's say, 5% difference, we'll call it a difference. If they're 10% different, we'll call it a difference. If they're 20% difference, we'll call different, we'll call it a difference. So um, many studies would just use sort of a cutoff like that of their choosing. Um, I'll, another common method was just to look at sort of, if you're looking at rates across multiple species, look at the average, you know, male-female ratio in, in mean um, body mass, which is really just using any difference as a, a difference. 
And so it was roughly measured um, in these previous meta-analyses. Um, so we set out to do this differently. We wanted to know if you adjust for species richness across taxa, what is the actual rate of sexual size dimorphism in mammals? And if you use statistics to determine dimorphism for each one. And briefly, we scoured the literature for sex segregated means and some measure of variance around each mean for each sex. Um, and we sampled each mammalian order. And we also actually went down to each mammalian family to try to sample according to its species richness. Uh, we required that it, the data be from wild, um, you know, unprovisioned, so no food provisioning, um, adult individuals, and we required a minimum sample size. Um, we excluded pregnant females when we possibly could. Um, and we did this for, we got the data for over 400 species, uh, used the 95% CI to assign um, species as monomorphic or dimorphic. The reason we used a sample size of nine was we actually got uh, data for over 600 species, and then we would we conducted an analysis to see how does this 95% uh, confidence interval in the mass difference relative to the uh, either the male mass or the female mass change with the sample size. So you can imagine, you know, like there's just less confidence in a mean if you if you have uh, a lower sample size, and so if you have these broad confidence confidence intervals, you'll get more monomorphism. Um, so we wanted to know when, it, like at what point is that sort of risk minimized? And we we just chose the elbow of this curve as our, our minimum sample size so that this all this variation here was at least cut out and we could um, concentrate on the sort of long tail. What we found was that 45% of mammals um, have larger males. So it's still like a, a big chunk but not most mammals. And also what I find more interesting is that there's a huge amount of monomorphism, just like Catherine Rawls uh, suggested. So this 39% or another huge chunk are monomorphic and then another 16% have larger females. And there was really interesting variation between the different orders. Uh, here you can really see the importance of sampling by species richness, because if you don't weight the data from rodents and bats very strongly, then you miss out on this, where, you know, nearly half of rodents have monomorphic um, or body mass monomorphism between males and females, and nearly half of bats have larger females. And uh, if you look at it as, as a sliding scale, there's, you know, a, a smear of points for each uh, order as to be expected. There's a lot of variation. Um, but, you know, th there's a lot of uh, species that are clustered or close to zero as well for each for each order, almost. And then there's really interesting stuff, like when you look into the families of each order. Um, so, for example, uh, the Lagomorpha, um, you know, rabbits, hares, pikas, pe pe um, they are famously, you know, have larger females, but that's actually mostly in the rabbits and hares, um, the Leporidae, and the Aquatonidae, which are the pikas, they um, have, you know, monomorphism in larger males. Um, in primates, there's a huge amount of monomorphism in the lemurs, and actually about half of the New World monkeys, um, even though the whole order itself, you know, has mostly larger males, there's within order variation that's quite interesting. And... Um, there's also all kinds of within species and within sex um, variation. And so, for example, uh, in prairie dogs and many species, the males start off the breeding season quite a bit larger than the females. But then as the breeding season carries on, they become exhausted um, and they end up the same size as females by the end. Um, and in the greater short-nosed fruit bat, there's interesting geographical variation where in the southern part of the Indian subcontinent, the female is larger, and in the northern or guess central uh, part of the Indian subcontinent, it's the males that are larger. Um, this, all, this, all this kind of points to like how reproductive strategies can affect relative size um, in all kinds of different ways, depending on the context. Uh, as a final point, um, you know, it was interesting to advance our state of the knowledge here 
um, just on a scientific level, but also just kind of more broadly, the larger males narrative has um, been a very strong narrative across um, the history of our um, study of sexual selection, but also it's not necessarily been a neutral element. And so people didn't just stop there where they said, okay, most mammals have larger males. Um, they would go on to often make claims based on that assumption um, that were quite a bit more insidious. Um, and so I think that correcting the record isn't just a matter of scientific interest or, um, you know, of rigor, but also kind of important so that we can scale back some of these other claims that are based on them. I was surprised um, that a question like this, for example, hadn't been tested with more rigor before. Um, and also at how many times Rawls was, um, she's widely cited, but often was ignored and, and sometimes several times miscited as having been in support of this larger males narrative. So there's been like this very strong inertia on this narrative. Um, and even the, there was a study that was much more expansive than ours. One important caveat with our study was that we only got to cover 5% of mammals because we were, had this sort of high quality data criterion. Um, and um, so, you know, the story can change with more data, but one thing that gives us confidence in it is that a much more expansive study by Lyndon Force et al. in 2007 looked at over 1,300 different species of mammals. Um, they, you know, used only means, um, and so they used like a 10% cutoff. But by their 10% cutoff measure, they actually landed at 45% larger males as well. So the same exact number as we did. But they also analyzed their data using just average ratios, male over female across the uh, data set. And they said, well, you know, on average, the ratio is over one. So like males tend to be larger than females and mammals. And so they fell back on the larger males narrative, even though uh, by their, their other analyses, it wasn't quite true. So um, this paper just came out uh, on Tuesday last week. It's actually received quite a lot of media attention. I've spent like two weeks interviewing and um, corresponding with journalists and my uh, partner posted it on Reddit and it kind of blew up there. Um, and so I think that that points to kind of this narrative having not been only entrenched in academia and our evolutionary theory and sexual selection theory, but also in kind of the broader public, um, because it seems to be a surprise. Um, so I'll end by just coming back to this. I think that, um, you know, multiple selection forces need to be considered studying when studying social systems. And that goes across my studies, like for the social, for the sexual selection study, there's, there's a well-documented bias of sort of the male perspective in sexual selection studies, um, you know, male, male mate competition being uh, very much emphasized over other dynamics. Uh, Dr. Malin A. King just came out with a book called The Female Turn that details this bias. She's a sociologist and an evolutionary uh, biologist, so she has a cool perspective on this. Um, and that affects the kinds of stories we tell and the kinds of questions we ask in science. But um, again, it's it's not just this one selection force acting on a, a given social system. There's also female reproductive strategy, strategies and a diversity of male reproductive strategies, um, not just physical contest. Um, and only when we can kind of maybe challenge the assumptions of what the patterns in nature really are, can we actually get to answering the uh more sort of, of a diversity of questions in our fields. So thanks so much for listening. Um, I'm uh, excited to field any questions that you have. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, really fascinating stuff and comprehensive across the social system. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions from people. So uh, at this point, I'm gonna open up the, the the opportunity to ask questions. Um, please remind, remember when you ask a question, please post a question mark in the chat. If you're a student or a postdoc, we really want to encourage you to participate. Um, it's a friendly crowd. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you want to, you know, say you're a student or postdoc, please put an S or a, a P next to your name and I will prioritize you. Um, if you're on YouTube, uh, please post your questions there and someone will relay that to Kaya. All right, so at this point, if there's any questions, um, please go ahead and start putting them in the chat.
So I, okay. So I see one from Clara, please go ahead. Hello, Clara. Yeah, here I am. Okay, just great. A sec, just a sec. There we go. Um, yeah, very interesting talk, Kaya. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, when I was in graduate school, Steve Emlin used to say all the time that predation could lead to group formation, but it couldn't lead to group maintenance. And I'm pretty sure what he meant by that was that predation isn't predictable in time and space. And so the animals can't track it like they could say food in a seasonal environment. Also, um, if you haven't seen uh, Emlyn and Oring's Science 1977 paper, Integrating Sexual Selection and uh, um, uh, Ecology, I would very much um, uh, recommend that. But my question is about um, the idea that uh, is about your data on male size. Now, as you know, we've moved far away from classical theory. There are all kinds of permutations and uh, re-understandings of sexual selection since classical theory. And one of the major ones extended by many, including Blum and Blum, uh, notably, is that classical theory, Darwin's work, sexual selection, is basically about reproductive competition. So when we measure, for example, mammalian sex differences in size, I think we want to be very careful that we think in terms of reproductive competition, particularly intersexual competition, male-male, which Darwin and many, most others um, emphasize, but female-female, of course, which Darwin de-emphasized and Huxley at the time, by the way, criticized. So um, do you think that reproductive comp competition is also important to measure? Yes. Um, and, you know, there's been really, once we kind of open up to looking for it among females, for example, um, there are instances that have come out, for example, really aggressive um, competition for males among the topi antelope. Uh, yes, I, I think I agree with you, broadly speaking, on both of those points. And I think that while a lot of us have finally moved away from kind of this sort of very entrenched thinking and emphasis of the male-male competition, you know, through physical contest, um, it's just got such a strong legacy in history and it has not reached the broader public by any means. They really do think that that's sort of the driving force of these, you know, relative sizes, for example, and a lot of the morphological dimorphism that we see. Um, and so, and, and Melina King talks about this also in her book. It's just very hard to catch up um, when you have a really long history of uh, a certain bias in, in the literature. Um, so, I mean, I guess that just means like we need much more, you know, uh, investigation of the other side um, and of, of the diversity of reproductive strategies. Uh, and, you know, I, again, like even there, there's sort of a male bias, like there's uh, quite a lot of work on, you know, post-copulatory uh, competition, sperm competition in the males. Um, and, you know, that does move away from like a need necessarily to be larger, uh, but it's still just looking at half this, half the, 
um, individuals. And so uh, female reproductive strategies and the diversity of them, they, there's been some work, you know, on um, like diversity of female preferences, sometimes preferring, you know, uh, friendly, amicable female males as partners rather than the strongest uh, one. Um, but it's just slow to catch up. Thank you. Um, just one. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Just one. No, I was just going to. Just one caveat. <laughs> just one caveat. Um, don't move too far away from male male competition. Keep in mind that females are the limiting factor for male reproductive success for male fitness. So we don't want to move, I think, too far away from what males and males are doing. But anyway, thanks. I, yeah. No, I, I take your point. And that is, um, you know, often what's guided my research. I think that there also is room to challenge even that assumption sometimes. So for example, you know, Bateman's um, experiments looking at how the number of mates increases fitness in male Drosophila, but not female fitness. You know, it's it's now been under heavy scrutiny, um, including by a really excellent work by Zulema here, um, where like it wasn't necessarily so. Um, and so I think that I, I'm, I'm quite sure it, it occurs in many cases, but I think that even that assumption um, can can use some scrutiny or more scrutiny than it does normally um, when you're focusing in on a certain system. Okay, I have to comment to that. I know the feminists and the large group, especially females, have criticized Bateman's work, but that's been reinterpreted also as the first emphasis of sexual selection on first principles leading, for example, to papers like Shaner's, showing the importance of metabolic strategies, um, energetics, et cetera. So again, I wouldn't dismiss Bateman that quickly because it links to a whole literature on first principles. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Okay, so our next question comes from Anna Marie. Yeah, hi, my name is Anna Marie. I'm a postdoc at uh, Universidad Católica in Chile. Uh, my question is about your uh, zebra study. Like, I might have missed a little bit on when you explained the the parasites and like the disease risk, because you mentioned that you. Um, we're not really able to get out of the car and everything. So how did you collect then um, like the parasites for these social groups? And did you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. For that, we we did uh, run out of the car to <laughs> um, collect. So we we're mostly, you know, mostly restricted to be in the car. Um, but, you know, when we watched a zebra poop, we would give it a bit of time to move away and it was actually sometimes quite difficult. You'd, you'd imagine like if you're in a grassland, like you just, you head over there and like you, you saw exactly where it pooped, but actually the, the distance can be quite um, deceiving um, when it's like a very sort of uh, like more of a homogeneous, um, you know, what's uh, but without many landmarks. Um, anyway, we what we ended up doing was like as a system, we would have, um, we had this like, laser like range finder so we would kind of like point the laser it would give us uh, an estimate of the distance of where the zebra was and then we would kind of like make sure we have the same angle and then we would just like walk <laughs> towards that and then to keep our eyes down just like to see when we hit the the dung uh yeah so we were able in short to walk out to to grab some dung uh that wasn't too much of an issue we were just meant to sort of stay mostly um in or very close to the car uh for safety reasons that makes sense. No, it's so, but mm -hmm. then like the there were no, no pairs like blood parasites and everything. So, like, how did you? There get no what sort of the par blood parasites and those kind of things. Like, how did you get? Um, oh yeah, we could not get blood. Yeah, no. Um, it's it's very. We would need like a vet team. 
um, to do that. It was all dung. Um, and so what we did, I mean, you can do a lot with dung. You can't get everything, but um, the titers I mentioned were from a, a previous study that where they had a vet team. Okay. Um, the measures that we got were, um, you know, fecal egg counts for different, all the kinds of different gut parasites that shed eggs and dung. We also did some immuno immunology work on the dung. Uh, I was able to measure things like immunoglobulin A. Um, and we also did genetic work to sequence the parasites that showed up in the dung um, through DNA metabarcoding. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is from Juan Jose Ovalle. Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, how are you? Good. I'm uh, I'm uh, an undergrad student, and I wanted to know during the wet season in, in the separate study during the when the wet season, how do the effect of the bachelors interact or contrast with the effect of the risk of disease during the wet seasons? Because because what I'm thinking is that you might get more disease risk aggregating. To search for water, for water, but on the other hand, you have to aggregate to avoid all well, because of the bachelors. Yeah. Um, how do they interact? I guess because the only way we could you know, really get at this with without direct experimentation was to look at the variation across time and space and. Temporally, it was, you know, the season was the big shifter of conditions and, and bachelor risk, we assumed, did not change very much seasonally. And so I guess you're thinking about the ones that aggregated more in the wet season, which was uh, the grubby zebras. How can we kind of tell if it's uh, bachelor pressure? Um, I guess one thing to note was that um, we don't expect aggregation to look for water. Um, there might be, there might be um, I, I guess, I think I see what you're getting at. There, there might be like brief aggregation around water sources um, and that can definitely occur. That would occur more in the dry season when there are fewer water sources. Um, and so everyone has to go to this like one source but those are very brief. You go drink and you and you leave relative to like the aggregation that you get in response to um, things like what we would assume like uh, uh, like social forces, um, like bachelor pressure. Uh, but I guess that can also be quite brief, and it gives an opportunity for disease transmission. Also, um, I'm trying to get. Can does that get at your question? I think I'm kind of um just kind of explaining things around it, but I'm not sure if I'm getting it exactly. I think it it does really. I I guess so. <laughs> if you think of a way to rephrase it, let me know. Not really sure. Okay. But what I was in terms of was... interactions, we weren't really like able. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Continue, please. Uh, we couldn't. We didn't look at interactions in our models. If that's one thing that you're worried about or, or thinking about, um, we, you know, kind of trusted that um, our study design could sort of tease apart what was strongest in a given uh, time and space. Um, in terms of aggregating force and a disaggregating force. Um, but I'm sure they do interact sometimes. Like, for example, bachelor pressure and predator uh, pressure could combine, you know, to increase group size in the dry season, um, which is why we kind of looked at it spatially also and according to male-female ratio. Um, so we kind of just used our study design rather than um, looking at interactions because are because our proxies were kind of indirect like we had season you know as a factor but that stood in for you know either food scarcity or disease risk depending on which season it was 
So it was it was tricky to look at interactions like in a statistical sense. Okay, thank, thank you for your answer. It, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from YouTube. Uh, Davies uh, Maya asks, can intestinal nematodes affect sociality and group formation and or stability? I think that they probably have a fairly weak effect on that. Uh, the reason we... So there can be an effect of like any kind of fecal oral transmitted um, disease like parasites and other diseases um, on group size. But I, I think it, that would be more in the form of avoiding densely populated areas. Um, so in terms of like your own group and who's around you, um, I, I think that they that that like pressure from those kinds of parasites would be more because they're not you know directly contagious. Um, they're just, just the the exposure risk comes from being around high dung density areas. So if you're in like a large group and there's just like a lot of poop where you're grazing a lot, then you know it does increase your um, exposure. But that can also happen if there's just like many groups in that area. Um, and so in terms of direct effects of those kinds of parasites on group size, I, I think it's more indirect effects um, like on, on population density and avoiding avoiding uh, densely uh, crowded areas, including like very large groups. But, um, you know, as a smaller group, you can kind of just move away from a, a denser area to mitigate that. It's, it's kind of an indirect effect. It's more contagious diseases, I guess that would be the direct um, effect on like, you know, the more sort of minute measures of group size. And so the, there was a follow-up question, um, in the grassland zebras, is it possible that males and females are affected differently? Um, like bachelor group size versus I'm not mixed sure. group size. I think I'm not sure what the um I I would assume that they're probably subject to the sim to like similar um they're probably similarly sensitive to things like food scarcity and disease risk um but then obviously the bachelor harassment pressure would be uh would differently affect them so I would expect the effect just to be in the mixed groups so I'm just going to say to Davies on on YouTube if that if you have a follow-up you want to ask, please go ahead and I will keep an eye on that. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, but I was going to ask some pretty simple questions about, uh, you know, I had, regarding the zebra study. And I apologize if I missed this. Um, is, is there any, did you examine or look at the effect of like population density on these animals in terms of the group formation and... I guess that would also impact potentially the the impact of the animals on the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been really nice to have that uh, because we were just running these like we didn't actually maybe we could have we did run these regular loops we could have maybe estimated population density. Um, and that's kind of so. There's actually like a couple of different lines of thinking and like, you know, kind of thinking about group size, there's the sort of adaptive um, responses to, you know, these hostile forces that is a popular way of looking at how group size might shift around um, in our field. But then there's also, um, you know, some theory on how ag there can be passive aggregation. Um, and so like, for example, if there's just a high population density in a certain area um if there's food resources like common food resources around but there could just be like passive aggregation which is i think definitely happening as well i think it's a mix of you know adaptive responses and just passive like happenstance type of aggregation um which i guess it would have been nice as like um an addition to the you know m measuring how these sort of potentially active responses to the hostile forces compared to just like how randomness like 
population density in a certain area at a given time like might affect um, just the chances of aggregating passively. Uh, we didn't get at that dimension. Um, it would, I guess, yeah, I was doing everything I could with the time I had, <laughs> but it would have been really cool to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, you can't cover everything in the field. Um, uh, um, I guess another question was, um, could you speak to like the the potential effect of the, you know, if the drying seasons are being extended, are they generally getting longer and therefore what impact could that potentially have? Um, it's really erratic. Interannual variation in rainfall is also very large. Um, so this study, for example, encompassed both like a full like El Nino, La Nina cycle. And so we had like a really wet year and really dry year and on the really dry year sometimes like an entire wet season can be skipped um and so it does really shift around quite erratically i think in this region there were some you know climate predictions of it actually getting wetter over time with climate change um but yeah i um i guess we'll have to see the um and yeah, I I mean, if these forces act in similar ways with that kind of shifting context, then um, I would expect more disaggregation in plain zebras um, and I guess less in the grubby zebras. Uh, the thing is, though, like if you turn the dial on any of these forces, it can really like like things can shift around in unexpected ways and they might not respond the same way. Um so, for example, in the Ngorongoro crater, which is quite a bit more lush um, than this landscape I was working in, in like semi-arid Kenya, uh, there there was more aggregation in plain zebras in the wet season. So that was a difference. It also just makes sense. I mean, they're like following the rains um, in this sort of like more migratory population. There's also more breeding synchrony actually that they do have. Uh, I guess they're just kind of, a, there's a bit more clockwork with like resource availability going on there. Um, and so it's possible that just bachelor pressure is like all the more, um, all the stronger uh, in the wet season. Uh, so, you know, if if you're, if you're changing the dials on these, they, they can actually swip, flip from like, uh, you know, aggregating in the wet season versus disaggregating in the wet season. Cool. Thank you. Um, I see there's a question from Karsten, so please go ahead. Yes, thank you for a very interesting talk. And um, these variety of study systems I also have some questions to the zebras and apologize if maybe probably you addressed it in your presentation, but there were so many things. Now the because you just used the verb aggregation, but in the plain zebras, you looked only at the group size of the core groups, which are kind of stable, isn't it? Oh no, we looked at the herd, like we looked at total group size. So if they were herding together, then that was one group for that time. Okay, so uh, so you are not looking at the main social unit, but um, different herds coming together. Yeah, just the overall who, who's moving together at this time, you know. Um, that was the group size. Yeah. That's oh, okay. where the variability comes from. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because I mean, in your, your, your results graph, you, you show variation in group sizes. There's not a lot of variation and it is not shown. Um, what, what, what is actually the, the, the scale on the Y axis. So it was not clear whether it goes from five to six to seven, but if it's all these, yeah, it probably goes from five to two hundreds or something like this. Yeah. Sorry about that. I guess it got cut out when I was, um, editing so i mean and those graphs too like they show the maximum range and it really should i should make one that's more scaled down to the, the more regular range um basically the whole range for both zebra species actually was quite similar um, from one to like 150 or so but the like variation that corresponded to like the seasonal variation and so on it would actually be by like a few zebras i think it was a change in like four to six plain zebras and a change in like about two grubby zebras per group, but which doesn't seem like very much, especially when you look at the whole range, but actually the average 
um, sizes or like a, I guess the median sizes, which are a better measure for when there's like this much skew, was uh, eight group members for both the gravity zebras and plain zebras, which I actually thought was kind of cool. Like it's like they really landed on very similar means and medians and ranges in the group size, even though they were shifting around their groups um, differently. Uh, relative to the median, like two two extra or two fewer is is actually not insignificant, and uh, and then there's even more for the plain zebra. So that was like more the regular um, kind of day to day uh, shifts that we saw. And I have a second question. I didn't think it through, so it might not be relevant. And then you tell us why. From my understanding, Samburu National Park is for both zebra species an extreme environment. It's one of the most arid environments for plain zebras, but one of the moist environments for the gravy zebra. So it's the, the opposite. Is this true? And if so, how can might this affect your species comparison? It's not quite true. Uh, the gravy zebras also range in much wetter areas. So Impala and Lewa, our other two sites are, are quite a bit wetter. Uh, Samburu would be like within their sort of historical range, and maybe that's what you're thinking. It's sort of like the southern limit of their historical range, but they, for many decades now, have been south of that. Um, it is a more extreme environment for the plain zebra. For the gravy zebras, it would be like a regular environment. For the plain zebras, it is a bit more extreme. There were actually quite a bit fewer plain zebras there. Um, so we, you know, had to do a lot of effort to sample enough there um, for both. Um, does that answer your question? Was, was there was there more to that question? So if it's for the plain zebra, the extreme environment, would you not expect maybe from this that there can be less variation because it's already already at, at the limit? So it might lead to uh -huh. less variation in in them than in the gravy zebras if it's for the for the gravy the mean environment. I mean, I think there probably was less. I don't know if we actually found less variation in group size. There were fewer groups. Was more what it was for the plain zebras um and the gravy zebras i think the variation was similar across sites to be honest if i remember correctly okay thank you mm -hmm. well i think uh i don't see any more questions in youtube are there any ah yes one just popped in uh so it's shakti um, hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, my question is about your study on the review that you did on egalitarianism. Uh, you know, the, the table that you showed. And um, I wanted to ask, uh, um, is there any possibility or are there any data available where um, one can compare uh, groups within a species? Mm. Uh, so you see what I'm saying? Multiple groups uh, within the same species and then look at the same kind of table, so kinship structure or um, grooming reciprocity, etc. But to, to do a within species, a cross group comparison uh, to kind of uh, understand um, whether there's a gradient there, because I guess overall your talk kind of points to, to the idea that you know, animal societies and animal groups, uh, especially animals that live in semi-permanent or permanent societies, that they are quite highly structured. And so, for instance, maybe a lot of the studies potentially that have been included in that review are just one, you know, one group or one study mm -hmm. population yeah. somewhere that's been sampled. Yeah. And so I guess my question is to do with, you know, how representative that is of the species as a whole, especially if we are seeing these relationships between the structure of a population and the, the behavior uh, that then- Yeah, very good question. Within. Yeah, I Thank take your point. I don't, I, I don't think this is representative. It's just one group. Um, I just, I guess it's more of an example of how egalitarianism can come about through, uh, you know, active uh, maintenance rather than just random interactions. But um, you're right. I think that, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a species trait. And in fact, it's unlikely to be a species trait. I think that cha things change by context and by um, all kinds of things. Uh, there are some data um, and studies that do look at variation across groups. One of them I can think of is, um, I think Eva Wickberg and Julie Tigrobe looked at uh, the 
uh, Colobus villarosus in um, like West Africa. They looked at uh, different groups of this Colobus monkey, a related monkey, um, and looked at how each of those groups were structured. And they did find variation. Sometimes it, kinship was more important. Sometimes dominance status was more of the, the prevailing, um, you know, or the the predominant uh, structuring force. Um, and so it, I think it can qu vary quite a lot. Uh, and, you know, I think that there can be even just sort of random variation, but also like uh, effects of the, the, the history of the group. Um, uh, for example, you know, Robert Sapolsky's baboons um, were famously sort of affected by you know, uh, a big bout of tuberculosis that, that took out the alpha males. And then suddenly the whole group became more peaceful and the females started to um, have more of a role in, uh, you know, power brokering and so on. And so, um, yes, I think that there's a lot of richness there that um, that should definitely be explored more. Great, thanks. Sorry, could you by any chance just type in that reference about the red colobus monkey, just approximately the authors, and I'll look for it. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Lauren, you had, yeah. had a question as well. Sure. That that last question, Shakti, really. I was thinking along these lines and I wasn't quite sure what to ask. So this may be incoherent, but uh, uh, <laughs> it seems to me also about scale too, about egalitarianism. You know, Craig Packer's classic study where he called lions egalitarian, fascinating work. But if you look at the figure in that paper, there's a lot, there's actually some of the units, the social groups in which there's complete reproductive failure by some females. And so I just, you know, I, I, I know you're talking about behavioral assays here, but well, I was thinking about egalitarianism and fitness, and we find in the Degus that there's a lot of variability within social units, even though this is a communal breeder that's been considered egalitarian. There are females that do really bad and females that do really good in the same group, and it's associated with the males. So in large groups, there's a lot wow. more variability and reproductive success within groups. And so I wonder, you know, I was I was trying to think of how to connect that to your the part of your talk where you were talking about egalitarianism. I, I don't even know if I have a question, but does that- I, Well, I think what that the, gets at is the trickiness of even defining egalitarianism, like egalitarianism among which group members, um, egalitarianism by what measure, what level. Um, I think fitness is always such a good one to fall back on if you have the data, but, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a- it's a tricky one. Um, and I think there's potential for, and I think like more, it's more probable for certain kinds of social interactions to be um, egalitarian, but others not necessarily being distributed in, in egalitarian ways. Um, it, honestly, like there's like just actually just not that much work done on egalitarianism in animal behavior. And so I think that there's like a little bit of a frontier here where uh, just like all our explorations of the ways that you can measure and, and look at dominance hierarchies there, uh, it, it could really benefit from a similar deep dive and, and um, like lots of work to, to get at what it means and what, um, and how it's, you know, shape, how it shapes societies. I think it honestly is equally interesting to dominance hierarchies. It just hasn't received as much attention. I wonder if like this will connect with, I'm going to pitch it in his um, Loreto's talk in a couple of weeks. She thinks about homophilic associations in related to masculinization and how that potentially could impact mm -hmm. social relationships and therefore the degree to which things are actually equal or not. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and actually the question of egalitarianism, particularly in um, other primates, is also relevant to uh, uh, to humans because a lot of, uh, um, because in humans, first of all, a lot of people argue that like uh, egalitarianism is most seen in hunter-gatherer societies, but there's a lot of debate about that as well. 
But secondly, some people argue that one of the fundamental changes that occurred in terms of us moving from other non-human primates to humans is the coming about of a kind of egalitarian structure and cooperation. Uh, so I guess it's kind of interesting, actually, to what extent you might find egalitarianism in other uh, primates. Sorry for my toddler in the background. Shakti, where, where, are, you, where are you from? Uh, I'm I'm from India, but I am based in uh, the UK in Cornwall, and um, I I actually work on human uh, cooperation. But I'm and I also work on kind of one of the things I'm working on is uh, demographic structure and the effects of things like uh, uh, structure, uh, population structure, on, uh, on 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 cooperation. So yeah, so these debates are so I'm I'm interested in you know this. This stuff is interesting as to how these structures themselves are affected is an interesting thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Karsten, you had another question? Yeah, there's more to add to this. I mean, I was also shocked to see the chimpanzees are said to be egalitarian. When I, was, when I read chimpanzee, I first thought that's the despotic volume. And I think so, like with so many know. other parts, we have okay. to come to continuous measurement of all these things, not egalitarian, yes or no, but in how far. And that leads me to my 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 actually question. I mean, your your study in nature communication, of course, is is very interesting and changes the point of view of some people. Um, but here you also use categories. Are you planning somehow to use this um, lot of data in a more continuous way um, to, to explain variation in sexual dimorphism from the scale of, 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 of female bias to male bias? Because I mean, still whether in a species the males are larger than the females, it can be 5%, it can be 50%, okay. which of course is something totally, totally different. Yeah, I would love to extend it more to to that more nuanced kind of analysis. Um, actually, I think at one point you and I were talking and Lauren also about potentially like combining data sets because it would be really cool to uh, relate these more continuous measures of dimorphism to things like mating system and things like, mm -hmm. um, you know, broader behavioral ecology um, because yeah, I think that there's a lot more there. Um, Our analysis I, is Although it's not published with all the mammals, we find that in pair living mammals, the females are on average larger than in other forms of social organization, which if you look at other taxa is uh, not that, that surprising. If you look at, at birds or fish or, or amphibians, that um, if there's one male, one female, it makes sense that the females are larger because then they can produce better offspring, which is a fitness benefit for both. Yeah. That does make sense. We're actually, actually now in regards yeah. to multiple paternity as well. We've got mm -hmm. this. Yes. Um, and I just shot, shot your paper over to Steve Dobson, who's working with us on that. Cool. I, I, I'm really, I'd be so happy to collaborate if we uh, can see some good, you know, um, convergence in the data sets. And our, ours is open access. It's it's published along with the paper. So you can take a look and see if it might work out in terms of the species included and so on. Um, it would be so cool to take this further. Yeah. Because it's good data. And it's like, you know, the sampling, uh, you know, the quality controls that we did, but also the sampling across the taxa. Like we were really careful to make it kind of as unbiased as possible. And we didn't throw out any data. Like sometimes we would get more data than we needed for like the well-studied species. And then we would just kind of subsample um, and do that a thousand times to make sure it wasn't overrepresented in any of the estimates. Um, so, I mean, there's, uh, I think a lot we can do uh, to kind of improve upon previous analyses using these approaches. Did you also include like whales? Because I remember with, like I did a review paper with the experiment competition and look at testicides, size, but then the yeah. whales are such an outlier that we just like, we're not even like, we just exclude this group. What the, what yeah. the We had a couple beaked whales. Let me just see. Zephyde. We had one monomorphic species and one larger. Oh, no, no. Sorry. We had one. Where is Zephyde? Sorry, sorry. Uh, that's in. Oh, yeah. Females were larger in both. Um, 
that was hard. I mean, like these are really hard to uh, like, you know, measure the mass of and to get the sample size, especially that was, that was a hard one. Um, we just had a couple in there. Um, that was for, that was for that, that clay, but um, actually there's also, we have Delphinidae, which is, you know, the dolphins and orcas and that there we had one monomorphic, one, uh, larger males yeah that's what we were able to cover for them <laughs> seems like there's a variety mm -hmm. well there's just a few people left so i think what i'll They're do also now not i'll stop the live stream yeah. and um and chat a little further uh but thanks kaya for a really fascinating talk and and post talk discussion um To everyone watching this, thanks for attending today and uh, hopefully you get to 